how do we actually um, um, use systems for machine learning, but also machine learning for computer systems problems. Uh, and I'm, I'd like to point out this is the work I'll be presenting is uh, um, joint work with many, many people at Google. So, uh, so first, the first part will be about systems for machine learning. And I think the, the um, motivating reason why this is really important is uh, highlighted by, by Bill's talk earlier is essentially that single computer, uh, single thread performance for kind of traditional um, sort of twisty integer code has uh, been slowing down for a long time, or not slowing down, not speeding up at the rate it was for many years. So for the last eight or 10 years, we've essentially not gotten the nice Moore's Law uh, boost, performance boost every year that we've been become kind of uh, lazy and accustomed to. Um, so what does that actually mean? Uh, it's kind of unfortunate that that's happened when deep learning is really creating these insatiable demands for computing. As we want to create more and more powerful models, you know, we want to train on larger data sets, we want larger models, we want to be able to train those models more quickly. For research productivity, we want to be able to turn the research crank and try out an idea as fast as we possibly can. And so that's really uh, kind of driving really strong demands for more and more computing. Um, and inference, once we have a trained model that we know works well, those systems need to be deployed in many, many places at very high uh, volumes of requests. Um, in low power environments sometimes for sort of things like uh, you know, mobile phones or, or even smaller devices. Um, some of these inference requests in data centers deal with hundreds of thousands of requests per second for computationally demanding models. So training and inference have these remarkable uh, performance demands and we're not getting the performance improvements we've been used to. Um, so we really need more computational power than we have today. And I really think deep learning in particular is transforming how we design computers. And I'll tell you two special properties that deep learning has. So first, uh, as Bill actually uh, highlighted in many ways throughout his talk, reduced precision is okay. You need very little precision for inference and you need less precision than the traditional HPC community has been used to for even for training. So 16-bit floating point formats work just fine, probably with more pushing in the sort of research and algorithm side, we can get that even lower. But reduced precision is essentially a really nice property when you're trying to build high performance computing devices because it means you can have more multipliers and, and less, uh, less worrying about the seventh significant digit. Um, and the other thing is that many deep learning models, many of the ones that are really making transformations in speech and, and, and computer vision and, and language processing, really are composed of a handful of specific operations and you know, different ways of, of composing those operations. But essentially, if you can do reduced precision linear algebra operations, matrix multiplies, vector dot products, uh, and do them at scale, that's really a really nice, flexible building block. It's not like you're specializing the hardware for a particular model. You're building a general purpose, reusable linear algebra acceleration system. And that can be really powerful for many of the uh, deep learning models that we want to train today and we think will be useful for uh, sort of even future algorithmic work that, that we've been developing uh, and will develop in the next few years. Um, so we've been building uh, custom machine learning hardware for a little while now at Google. Um, one of the first things we tackled was the problem of inference because we saw that as the most pressing need uh, several years ago. So starting in about 2013, we really kind of realized that if we wanted to deploy powerful uh, neural net models for things like speech recognition online or computer vision so that we could um, you know, uh, do uh, image classification for Google, things like Google Photos, we really needed to have high throughput uh, systems. And many of these also needed low latency if they're online. Things like speech recognition and translation uh, really require low latency operations. Uh, and so the first thing we did was build a design a custom ASIC for doing inference. And uh, inference is a much easier problem than training uh, because typically you can get all the computation you need for a model on a single chip, a single board, and then when you need more capacity, you essentially just add more boards, add more chips. Um, and so that's been in production use for three years. You know, every Google query that you, you send us, we use it for many different kinds of models. We use it for all the machine translation work uh, that we've been doing, speech recognition. It was used in the AlphaGo match. Uh, this is actually the rack of systems that we used in the uh, 
AlphaGo match against Lisa Dahl with a little Go board on the side. Um, and there's a paper you can see in ISCA last year about sort of uh, a fairly detailed performance analysis of how that, that uh, chip works. Um, but if what we really care about is, is training as well, that's a much more complicated system. And the way I would describe it is you really need to think much more holistically than a chip uh, for training systems. Uh, and the reason is a single chip is unlikely to give you the turnaround times and the scale that you need for training on large data sets. There will always be data sets that are much, much bigger and much more computationally challenging than a single chip can really deliver. Um, and so we really need to be thinking at the you know, custom accelerator level, uh, at a chip level, at the interconnect level for building systems that really uh, can train models quickly, train very large, powerful models quickly. And this is actually really important because um, speeding up training is useful for very large production uses, but it's also kind of the key to driving researcher productivity in this field. If people want to do experiments and your experiment takes several weeks, that's just a very different regime than if you're doing experiments and an experiment can be turned around in an hour. Like it's just a different kind of science, a different feeling to the cadence of, of work that you can do. You can try out many more ideas. And so we think driving training time down is really important for, for a variety of reasons. Um, and so the, the system we've come up with for uh, doing training, the first ver ver version of it, is called the Tensor Processing Unit uh, version 2. Uh, and you can see this is uh, one device with four chips on it. If we zoom into one of those chips, uh, then you can see that it is a, a fairly simple design. It essentially has a large matrix multiply unit. So uh, it does 128 by 128. Uh, matrix uh, uh, floating point multiply add uh, units um, that are sort of uh, treated as a systolic array for doing uh, multiplies, and it has scalar and vector units, and it has two cores, so, um, uh, and then has 16 gigabytes of HBM memory attached to this, uh, each chip, um, with each core being able to access eight gigabytes. Uh, and it has quite a lot of memory bandwidth on this, and we use reduced precision in the multiplier units, but uh, we support 32-bit um, floating point um, uh, operations in the rest of the chip. Uh, and so one of those chips gives you 45 teraflops of compute, which we think is, is pretty nice. And then the, the whole device gives you uh, four times that, so 180 teraflops with quite a lot of memory bandwidth, two and a half uh, terabytes per second, um, uh, and 64 gigabytes of memory. And one of the things that we've done is designed the system to be connected together into larger systems. So this is sort of like the basic building block, and then you can assemble those into larger systems that we call pods, with um, 64 of those devices connected together in a, a 16 by 16 mesh of chips um, with wraparound toroidal toro uh, uh, wraparound links, uh, which gives you 11 and a half petaflops of, of compute. And we think this is a pretty interesting amount of compute for trying lots of different kinds of ideas. You can slice this uh, pod into subpods of, you know, uh, one, two, four, eight devices and so on to allow people to share this larger thing or you can use it uh, as a single unit. Um, and one of the things that we've really uh, tried to focus on in building out this system is not just the hardware level but also how do we actually express um, uh, machine learning models in a way that makes it relatively easy to get good performance across um, you know, one of these devices or across the entire pod. And so uh, one of the things we've been focused on is high level programming abstractions in TensorFlow so that the same program will run with essentially minor modifications on CPUs, GPUs, or on these, these new TPUs. Um, and that same program will scale with synchronous data parallelism without modification on the pods. So you can take the program, run it on one of these devices, and you get a certain amount of performance. And if your program is amenable to larger batch sizes, you can just um, say, no, I'd like eight or 64 devices, and it just goes. Um, so that's pretty nice. Uh, conveniently, this week, we actually, uh, we've been having these in alpha testing in a quiet, quiet way with a bunch of customers. Uh, but now we've opened the door uh, by make, putting them into beta in our cloud products as a cloud TPU uh, accelerator. So you can essentially get a virtual machine with a cloud TPU attached. And uh, customers have been seeing that, uh, you know, the kinds of benefits we, we hoped would emerge, you know, what would normally take days can now take hours. 
Um, that's the kind of experience we want to deliver with uh, this kind of new hardware. Um, the other thing we've been working on is putting out a set of official models that we uh, have uh, been focused on delivering good performance on, and we know that they converge to the right accuracy level and so on. And this, this list will grow over time. But we think that's going to be a pretty compelling thing, because if, you, if your problem is exactly one of those things, you could just take it and run it without any development. And if you uh, want to take that and modify it a little bit, it should be a good starting point for, for uh, most things. There's also an experimental directory in that that has some other things in there. But uh, you know, those will be growing over time. Uh, let's see. Uh, so under the covers for mapping this TensorFlow program onto um, these devices or onto other kinds of devices like CPUs or GPUs, uh, we have an accelerated linear algebra system uh, called XLA that is essentially a compiler for linear algebra. And it targets uh, many different kinds of systems. Um, and it's both a compiler, a runtime, and then has accelerator-specific optimizations in it. Um, and the compiler and the CPU and GPU backends are open sourced. You can find them in the GitHub repository, that URL. Uh, but essentially, you have a model that people typically express in Python that constructs a TensorFlow graph. That graph is then given to XLA, which does a bunch of targeted independent optimizations, things like algebraic uh, simplifications, these kinds of things. Uh, and then it uh, goes into the back end of XLA, which has some target specific code generation for the particular device that you're, you're running on, in this case, TPUs. Um, so we built these both for our own internal use, but also now exposing them as a cloud product. But uh, one of the things we really care about is being able to scale to much larger kinds of models and to much larger data sets. And so for example, uh, one of the first things that we got running on this was our internal search ranking model uh, training system which previously used a bunch of CPU-based machines, took 132 hours, uh, now, now runs in nine hours on a quarter pod. And that, that's the kind of um, improvements that, that, we, uh, that we typically see. We got uh, similar speed ups for image models. Uh, we are actually using these in production for inference for WaveNet, uh, which is a text-to-speech system uh, developed at DeepMind to generate speech at 20x real time. Um, uh, which actually makes this launch possible. Uh, that, that's a pretty computationally demanding model. Um, it, we can also uh, you know, train ResNet on cloud TPUs uh, with a little bit under a day uh, to get to 76% accuracy on one device, and then that scales to 45 minutes on a half pod, uh, and so on. Uh, and we get pretty close to linear scaling on these pods. So uh, if you look at the images per second, um, the speed up curve is, is pretty good as you go from 1 to 2 to 4 to 16 to 64 devices. Um, and we also have a transformer model, which is a, a, a research uh, project out of our group. The attention is all you need paper that allows you to uh, essentially do very parallel kinds of computations for uh, um, natural language kinds of applications as well as uh, some kinds of speech applications. Um, um, so one of the things we, we uh, are doing with these TPUs is we're making 1,000 of these devices available to uh, researchers in machine learning who are committed to both publishing the results of their work openly and ideally open sourcing the code related to their, to their work. Um, and uh, also will be willing to give us feedback about what kinds of things work well on TPUs and, and how they are, you know, give us honest, candid feedback about what works well, what doesn't. Uh, and uh, you can, we have a few researchers using these already, and uh, we'd like to see more of them. So feel free to visit that URL and sign up if you think you have an interesting machine learning uh, algorithmic question or an application of machine learning to a particular area of science or, or engineering. Um, we'd love to see more people doing that. Uh, so one of the questions that, that Bill alluded to in his talk is, there's this uncertainty about building machine learning hardware today that needs to uh, run the algorithms and, and models of tomorrow, and we don't know what those are. And in particular, there's uh, a rapidly changing field. Uh, if you plot the Moore's Law exponential that we used to have in computer hardware, that's nothing compared to the uh, archive paper growth rate. Um, so, you know, it's quite uncertain exactly what kinds of things we will want to run on these, these uh, kinds of systems. 
and if you start an ASIC today, uh, basically that starts to get deployed two years from now if you do, uh, go pretty fast. <clears throat> and it has to remain relevant essentially for a three-year lifetime. So that means we have to predict five years from now what do we want to run on these devices. Um, can we see what the future clearly enough? And I think there's a lot of interesting questions in doing this. And one of the things that I really like about our, the way we're approaching this is we often get our machine learning researchers, our sort of computer system software people together and our computer architects together. We have a once a week meeting to actually discuss, you know, what kinds of new interesting algorithmic ideas exist, you know, what kinds of things could we do in hardware that might be useful for a machine learning perspective. Um, and things like, you know, precision, could we do very low precision training? I think it's pretty clear we can do very low precision inference, but if we could do one to four bit, uh, you know, training in some way, that would be pretty fundamentally uh, transformative, I think. Uh, sparsity and embeddings, uh, how do we do dynamic routing of very large models where only a portion of the model is activated for any given example, and now all of a sudden you have a large batch of examples and they all kind of want to be routed very differently through this much larger model. Um, how do you deal with things like that at the hardware and software level? Um, some things want very large embeddings for some problems, so if you're doing, say, a, a video recommendation model, you might want to uh, an entry for every video in a large scale system like YouTube, and you might want a thousand dimensional embedding for each video so you capture kind of the, the nuances of, of how this video relates to lots of other ones. Um, how should we think about batch size? You know, our view is, is there's some promising looking research that shows that we can actually increase the batch size fairly substantially for a lot of problems. Um, on the other hand, batch size one is kind of a nice, easy thing to reason about from a research perspective. I think adding a batch size dimension really forces you to turn every 2D thing into a 3D thing and kind of makes my head hurt sometimes. Um, so it'd be nice to maybe express things in bat terms of batch size one computations. Uh, will SGD be the way that we optimize these models or will some other optimization technique take over and, and become more dominant? Will that have the same sorts of primitives like uh, low precision linear algebra or will something else be needed? Um, these are the kinds of open questions we we bat around at our weekly meeting, which is kind of fun. Um, OK, so let me switch gears a bit and talk about where I think uh, turning things around and looking at how machine learning can really impact computer systems is uh, a, an interesting direction to, to look. Um, first of all, I think today, the state of things today is that we don't really use that much machine learning in most of computer systems today. Um, most low-level systems code, thing, things like operating systems, compilers, storage systems, really don't make much use of machine learning. Uh, but I think this should really change. And I'll give you a few examples of why I think there are great opportunities for this. Um, so one is uh, we've been doing a bit of work in our group on machine learning for high-performance machine learning models, uh, somewhat meta. Um, and we know that for some kinds of models, uh, not only do you need data parallelism, but you sometimes need model parallelism as well, where you take a large model and you decompose it so that it runs across many different computational devices where each device runs part of the model computation and this other device runs another part of the model computation. Um, and the reason that's important is sometimes you don't have enough memory on a single device to fit the activations or the weights for, for the model uh, and you want to spread the model out over more devices to get speed up or more memory and so on. Um, but it's often not obvious how to decompose the computation for a single sort of abstract model onto those different devices in a way that gives you good performance. Uh, so here's an example. You have a, a simple LSTM-based uh, 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 language model with uh, an attention mechanism and some softmax computation at the top. Um, one simple thing you could do is if you had four devices just kind of put those things on different uh, GPU cards, that would be good because then the parameters for each of those layers wouldn't have to move at all as you step through the time steps of the computation. Um, but that, that might not be the optimal thing. It's sort of what a human expert might sit down and say, ah, this is the way I think it, I should do it. Um, so one of the things we've been exploring is actually using reinforcement learning to place comp pieces of computations in, in these large models across many devices. So the problem set up is you give a computation as a graph of, of operators and, and dependencies, and you give a set of devices that you say, I want to run this on four GPUs or eight GPUs. Um, and then 
uh, this actually turns out to be a perfect reinforcement learning problem because you can make a placement for all the nodes in the graph, then you measure how fast it runs, and then that gives you a reinforcement learning signal back to the model that does the placement, and you can now steer closer to ones that seem to perform better and away from uh, uh, placements that seem to perform badly. Um, and that measured time per step essentially gives you the, the pure RL reward that you like. Um, and this actually works and comes up with some non-intuitive placements. Uh, so the first iteration of this, uh, we did um, placement of graphs with uh, sort of hand grouping by humans to say, I think these you know, set of 20 nodes in the graph should go together. Actually, just uh, the names of the nodes in the graph had a hierarchical aspect of them. So it would be like LSTM cell 7, and that would be a unit in, in the placement. But we still got pretty good speed ups there. Uh, and um, since then, we've been uh, trying to generalize that so that the model actually does the grouping of nodes automatically as part of the end-to-end -end learning process. And so now we have a hierarchical model that takes uh, a large graph and inputs it one node at a time into a model um, with information about the specific operator, the connectivity to other nodes, uh, maybe the shape, the shape information about um, the likely input sizes and, and so on. And then it does two things. It first does a grouping of a bunch of nodes into a set of groups, and then it places those groups onto a bunch of devices. Um, and uh, this actually works reasonably well, and it can actually even split some of these uh, larger uh, computations into a bunch of independent pieces that can be placed separately onto different uh, placement nodes. And so here's the placement for a four-layer translation model um, where it's actually done that, where it's split the individual LSTM uh, layers into multiple independent pieces that are not independent pieces, uh, multiple uh, dependent pieces that happen, the computation happens in parallel. And this is actually quite a bit faster than the best human uh, placement that we've been able to come up with. Um, and there's a poster of this in the, the poster session. Um, Another area that I think is pretty interesting is uh, to look at how could we learn traditional uh, uh, algorithms and data structures uh, using machine learning rather than uh, using things like B trees or hash tables or hash functions or uh, um, bloom filters. And so uh, this is some joint work uh, with Tim Krasko, who's here, Alex Buto, who's here, uh, Ed Chi, and uh, Neokolis Polozotis. Uh, essentially, the idea is that if if you think about a B tree, a B tree is really kind of an approximate lookup mechanism that gets you close to where that key must reside in a sorted list of elements. Um, and if you think about what a machine learning model can do, a machine learning model also can give you an approximate position. If we train the model to give roughly the right position for a particular key in a set of keys, um, we can actually replace the, the B tree with a neural net based model that does uh, the same input-output that a B-tree does. And um, the way to view this is we're trying to predict the position in the cumulative distribution of all the keys uh, in the B-tree. And this is somewhat tricky because sometimes these uh, CDFs are very ragged and have kind of weird local, local behavior, as you see here. Uh, but it turns out you can actually do this. And it actually works pretty well. So if you take a B tree with an index of 200 million uh, web service log records um, and you find the best, uh, the fastest B tree page size for lookup time, um, what you find is that, uh, you know, that's a 13 megabyte data structure roughly. And if you do this learned index where we now have a bunch of little small neural nets and we learn a pathway through them for different uh, parts of the key space, we can actually uh, on a CPU running the learned index computation, uh, we can actually get something that's 60% faster than the B-tree at 1 20th the space. Uh, we can actually get something 17% faster at 1 100th the space. And that kind of allows us to be able to make these nice trade-offs as well. Um, so we think that's pretty interesting. And we think if you had hardware acceleration for the kinds of operations in these neural nets on, on the chip, uh, we could actually uh, do even better. But uh, we're pretty excited about that. Uh, for hash tables, uh, the essential idea here is a hash function is really just a way of taking a key and then spraying it around the, the hash table uh, bucket space. Uh, if you instead 
use a neural net model to do the hash function, you can actually get uh, significant reductions and improvements in space utilization uh, if you assume that you know something about the key distribution um, in the, the, hashing, the hash function. And this actually works with any kind of hash table underneath. So if you had open chaining or you know, cuckoo hashing, you can, you can combine that with, with this approach, which is really just replacing the, the, um, the hash function with a learned model. And similarly, bloom filters can also be done this way. So instead of a bloom filter, you can have a model that just learns to predict is this particular key in the set of keys that is uh, in the, the set for the bloom filter. And you can actually get pretty significant space improvements using these neural net based um, uh, learned bloom filters. 36% space improvement with the same false positive rate. Uh, and there's an archive paper that describes in all of this in much more detail. So we think this is a pretty interesting direction to go and it's one example of a computer systems problem that has not traditionally been looked at from an ML perspective and we think there's a lot more of these things. Um, so where else could we be using learning? Um, you know, computer systems in general are filled with heuristics and those heuristics are generally handwritten like should I insert this block into the buffer cache? Uh, well, I might take a few factors into account and then give an answer yes or no. Um, compilers have all kinds of things. Should I tile the loop this way or that way? Should I like interchange the loop nest? Um, and these heuristics generally have to work well in the general case. Uh, and they can't actually really adapt to the actual pattern of usage very well. Um, even simple things like LRU cache replacement policies are good for most kinds of cache access patterns but fail quite badly for many other, for some kinds of pathological access patterns. Um, and they also generally don't take into account the available context. To give you an example, we have a, big, a storage system at Google called Bigtable and uh, clients can make requests of, uh, for Bigtable to load up different kinds of, of data from disk and the Bigtable system has a decision to make of should it cache a particular block that a client has just requested. Um, and obviously if the client is scanning sequentially over a bunch of data and will never reuse it, you don't want to insert in the block cache but if they're likely to be doing random access to it and might reuse it, then you, then you do want to do this. Um, so as an example of something you would never handwrite into a heuristic, but which would probably make sense in a learned system, if at Google, if the job name starts with MapReduce dash, it's probably doing a sequential scan over the data and will never reuse it. And a learned system might actually be able to take into account things like the job name, the, the, uh, the user on which, under which this job is running, and things like that and actually learn really good heuristics that uh, behave in an online manner that actually do a good job of capturing these kinds of effects that you would never hand code, you know, if name starts with MapReduce, then don't insert in cache. Um, anywhere we're using heuristics to make a decision, I think, is a, is a ripe opportunity for using machine learning instead in an online manner. Uh, think about compilers, there's instruction scheduling, there's registration, loop nest parallelization strategies, networking has all kinds of decisions about when to back off, uh, when to increase or decrease the window size. Uh, operating systems have things like buffer caches, file system, prefetching, many, many things. ASIC design, physical circuit layout, I think is an interesting thing, test case selection for testing chips. Uh, anywhere we've punted to a user tunable performance option, which uh, many people have a tendency to do. These are just a sampling of the hundreds of thousands of flags that exist across the Google code base for doing things like, you know, how many event manager threads should I have? Should I use a batch size of eight or 16 in some scheduler? Uh, these kinds of things. Um, and really, I think there's opportunities to use machine learning for machine learning itself. Uh, we've already seen a lot of this with the neural architecture search with uh, sort of meta-learning, evolutionary techniques, uh, learning placement decisions, learning fast kernel implementations, um, uh, learning activation functions, all these kinds of things are in the process of being explored in the research community. Um, so I think the keys for success obviously are can you have a, a nice way of c describing the reward that you want and have a clean interface for how do you actually integrate a machine learned model into the guts of a sort of low level piece of C++ code in the middle of an operating system or a compiler. And one of the things we're exploring is what APIs might make sense that uh, offer 
the ability to essentially make a sequence of choices in some context, get feedback about those choices, perhaps in a distributed setting where some of the choices are made in one process, some are made in another, um, and then make all of this work with very low overhead. Like, because you actually want to be able to run a small model to make a decision of should I insert this in the buffer cache or not, and that's a fairly performance demanding uh, situation. Um, and so uh, we think there's really interesting directions to explore here. Uh, so in conclusion, two things. One, I think machine learning hardware that is customized for the kinds of operations we want to, to run at scale uh, for very large, powerful machine learning models on very large data sets is really at its infancy and is really going to be an exciting time in the next you know, five or 10 years. I think the fact that sort of specialization and looking carefully at this narrow, narrow set of operations we really want to run will allow us to really have a lot of creativity in the computer architecture space, uh, whereas a lot of the Moore's Law improvements was much more about the process. Uh, and I think that's, that's really exciting. I think learning in the core of our computer systems will actually improve them tremendously and make them more adaptive and responsive. We won't have these you know, falling off of a performance cliff that sometimes happens when your usage pattern doesn't match the, the sort of hard-coded heuristic that exists in there. Uh, and with that, I'll take questions. So thank you. We definitely have time for several questions. So uh, I, I, it's on the first part on the batch size. So the thing you know we were all saying and teaching and writing papers about was that learning is an inherently sequential process and you have to keep the batch small. Otherwise you get uh, in this narrow minima and narrow minima do not generalize and we have all written many papers about the implicit regularization of small batch SED. And now there's like, oh yeah, forget all that. We can actually train with a huge batch and it's great. So that completely throws out uh, at least my understanding of all these papers we were thinking and uh, writing about. Mm -hmm. So what is your belief now about, about this discrepancy? So, uh, so my belief is that we actually, for large data sets and large models, we can actually tolerate larger batch sizes than people are traditionally thinking about. So uh, you know, we've got evidence that uh, you know, batch sizes of 32,000, 64,000 are actually pretty OK for, for larger problems. And I think that means that you can actually use data parallelism at a, at a pretty large scale. Think something like a whole pod yeah, can actually change the picture. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, and so we've been doing a bit of theoretical work. Uh, um, a couple of people in our group have published a paper called Don't, Don't Decrease the Learning Rate, Increase the Batch Size. And uh, that, I think, is a pretty interesting um, view on, you know, traditionally you have a learning rate schedule where you start out with a high learning rate, you lower the learning rate, and then you lower the learning rate. They've been able to show that this is essentially equivalent to keeping the learning rate the same, and where you were going to reduce the learning rate by a factor of 10, instead increase the batch size by a factor of 10, and then do that again. So now you've increased the batch size by a factor of 100 from when you started. And that actually, the interesting effect that has is if you have highly parallel hardware, the last two thirds of your training goes to almost zero, and you're really now in this regime where the early part of training where learning happens very fast happens with a small batch size, but now takes you know, all of your time instead of a third of your time. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's interesting implications there. We don't fully understand everything there, but I think it's a pretty interesting yeah. direction to explore. And would love like, more theoretical treatment of the effects of batch size. I think that's a pretty interesting direction to look at. Yeah. Hi. Uh, I think it's great that we have all of this new ML hardware opportunity here. A lot of the discussion about it focuses on the compute side of that, uh, but I think as the compute gets faster, the interconnect becomes important. You guys clearly put a bunch of thought into the interconnect of the TPU v2, and I'm curious what sort of concerns uh, went into that. Yeah, I mean, I think I would say you know you want a balanced system, right? It's not so useful if you have you know, obviously training needs many many chips. If you take that as a given for large problems, then you want a system that is balanced in the sense that you don't want so many floating point operations that you can't feed that chip. So we actually put together a pretty balanced system in terms of having quite a lot of memory bandwidth, uh, uh, quite a lot of, of, of flops, and also good interconnect bandwidth to other chips. 
Uh, and we found that a 2D mesh structure worked pretty well for the designs we were looking at, um, simply because a, a lot of data parallel things can map pretty well onto that. Uh, and you can kind of do all reduces in one direction or the other. Uh, and that works pretty well. Um, so yes, I, I, I don't know what more to say, but if high, high interconnect bandwidth makes a lot of things easier because then you essentially have more tightly connected floating point operations than, than you do with a much more starved network. And it, it also makes possible much more thing, much more use of model parallelism as well. The, the more sort of network connectivity you have, the more that makes sense. Yeah. Hi. Uh, I have a question regarding specialized hardware for machine learning. So you mentioned that it's hard to predict the future of what would the machine learning scene in five years. Does you, what about the reverse effect? Like, does your choice of hardware for machine learning makes the future model limited to what you have uh, uh, enhanced today? Like, if convolution takes like thousand times faster, does it, does it mean that machine learning researcher will stick to convolution because it takes less to train? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think for problems at scale, obviously, you, you will use the primitives that are fast and allow you to compute at, on sort of the, the problems of the size that you, you care about. And so we're trying to make a prediction of you know, which kinds of primitives will make the most sense to be the most flexible for today's algorithms and the algorithms we think will be developed. Uh, as Bill said, you sometimes can take a bet of a little bit of your chip area to say, well, let's try out these three ideas in hardware that we think might be useful, but maybe you know, we're not sure, uh, but that's an okay bet because it's essentially just dark, dark uh, transistors that aren't necessarily con consuming power unless you use them. The other thing I would say is these things need to co-evolve. And so if people have genuinely good ideas that they can demonstrate on a small scale that we're sure would, or that we have a fair amount of confidence, if we put that in the hardware, things would be even better, then that's the kind of, of small-scale experiments that I think make a lot of sense, like demonstrate something on MNIST or CIFAR with a particularly new kind of approach, and maybe simulating what it would look like in CPU or something, and then we can sort of look at that evidence and take it from there. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Pretty interesting talk. So I have two questions. One is, how generalized is the uh, learned policy with the RL. Under a different setting, different hardware setting, different, even the graph setting, you do need to learn it again. And um, one more thing is, uh, what are the insights that you can give to the programmer? So it's very interesting, RL works, different techniques works, but how can you tell a programmer, okay, from now on, you write your code this way so you can get a p better performance. Um, what are the insights that you can get from mm -hmm. this learned policy? Thank you. You mean particularly for the placement, for example? Yes. Ah, so um, first of all, uh, if you right to date, the experiments we've done, we essentially start the RL model from scratch when we want to place a new particular kind of model. Uh, the future work is we are going to train a single model that can place many different kinds of models. And by placing you know, a thousand models, it's likely that many models share many common subpieces and that we'll be able to get in a very good state quickly for the thousand and first model when we want to place it. Um, and assuming we do that, then this iteration doesn't really take that long to, to actually come up with a good placement. You know, it's maybe on the order of you know, 30 minutes or an hour for a model, uh, assuming you have enough parallel resources to try experiments. And if you're gonna be running something for you know, many times or running it for you know, a day, that's perfectly okay. Uh, the other thing I would say regarding giving programmers insight, I think programmers don't want to worry about this, right? If you're a machine learning uh, researcher, you just want your model to run as fast as possible. You don't really want to know, oh, I should really think about how I spread this out across GPU 4 and GPU 3 and how the parameters move. You don't want to deal with that. So I think what we need to do is use these kinds of techniques like automated placement to raise the level of abstraction that we provide to programmers. I think that'll be a much better solution than trying to like extract performance insights. There may be room for that in some cases, but I think most people really would rather not have to deal with that. Okay, okay let's thank our speaker again.
Thank you.